spending my ninth Vasa at Balan, 1969. A few days later, the villagers of Balan received news that I was residing and practicing in Bandung Wai. They came to see me and invited me to Balan, and so I traveled to Ban Balan, Bong Noi Subdistrict, Doi Luang District, Chiang Rai Province. The location was an uncultivated forest densely populated by large trees of various species. The villagers came out and constructed a place for me to stay. They built a small hut with bamboo strip floors, bamboo poles, and a cog and grass thatch roof. It was sufficient. One night, I had a vision, Nimitta, of a visit from Lung Pu Kao. He placed his hand on my shoulder and said, Not too long from now, that which you have set your mind to will come to fruition in this very place. That moment, there appeared a large, smooth path that led directly up to where I was sitting. Lung Pu Kao said, you must walk along this path. Soon you will reach the end of suffering. Then my mind, Chitta, withdrew from meditation. I thought about Lung Pu's words and how it could be possible, because at that moment, I didn't have a Dhamma model, Ubaya, to give me confidence that I would finish. Each day that passed, my practice of mental cultivation progressed as usual. There was still no path out of suffering. The path I saw in the Nimitta was just a Nimitta, it couldn't be used to guarantee I would be free of suffering, but I was determined to practice to my fullest ability in this lifetime. Whether or not I would be able to be successful, my breaths would decide. If my breath entered but didn't exit, or if my breath exited but didn't enter, that would be the determinant in the end. Whether I make it or not, this is all the time that I have. While I am still breathing, my body is strong, my mindfulness and wisdom are sharp, and I am sufficiently able. I will focus on practicing mental cultivation to the fullest. My mindful wisdom constantly reminds me not to be reckless in life. Each day and night passes, and our lives also pass with time, with every minute. As of now, I haven't reached the end of suffering. I must hasten and accelerate my practice to full throttle. Pay no mind to that nimitta. Don't wait for the merit, punya, karmic imprint, vasana, and virtues, varami from past lives to catch up and lend support. I don't know how much barami I cultivated in past lives. Pay no mind to that barami. Right now, just practice mental cultivation to the fullest. Every day, every night, and every moment is significant. Don't allow time to be wasted. I must find a way to use that time advantageously. I have been born in an era of Buddhism. I have already experienced the burdens of life. Now, I have come to know the path out of suffering that the Buddha has laid forth. This life is an opportunity, so I shouldn't conduct myself in a way that floats along the world's currents as in the past. The time we have in this life is limited. A few years in the future, we will pass away from this world, and we don't know if we are going to be born into Buddhism like in this lifetime. We have been born and died, been born and died, and cycled through many rebirths in this world for some time now and we will continue to be born and die in future rebirths without knowing when it will ever end. As long as we still have the fuel for defilements and desires leading us to be reborn, there will be no end to arising, chati, and becoming, pava. In this life, I am physically ready and mentally ready. I will pour everything I have into practicing with full effort. I will wager my life on it. There were two monks residing together that rains retreat, Vasa. Me, Pra Ajarya Wan Pantito, and the novice Samanera Sawai. The villagers said that that area was haunted by a lot of spooky ghosts. The natives didn't dare enter that zone to forage for food, because ghosts had already caused many people to die. After practicing mental cultivation there for seven nights, one night, as my chitta reached full meditative calm, I heard a loud sound, like a mountain crumbling, coming from the bottom of the waterfall. It was around 100 meters from where I was. I directed my mind, Jitta, to see what was going on. It turned out to be two large wild boars seething with rage. Both of them were looking at me with eyes red like burning flames as they expressed their great resentment of me. Then the two wild boars showed off their power in various ways, acting menacingly in order to incite fear. They hurtled toward me with great speed as if to kill me that very instant. Their eyes burned like fire. They growled threateningly and continuously. They circled my hut three times, 
then stood side by side about three meters in front of me. The two boars crouched down and rocked back and forth two times, as if to gather up momentum. When they rocked the third time, they leapt at me with great force in order to bite me. I had summoned my strength to repel the attack, so when the two boars lunged forward, I directed my charged mental strength to deflect them with full force. As our powers clashed, there was a loud crack, then the two boars were flung back onto the ground. For a moment, the two boars just lay there. When they came to, they appeared in human form. Their bodies were burly and muscular. They crawled in toward me, and with docile humility, they raised their palms together in the lotus position at their chest, Vandana, and said, The two of us have ruled over this land for a long time. We have caused many people to die. This time, we intended to cause you to die as well, Acharya, but we were unable to do so. We admit defeat to you, Venerable Acharya. May you grace us with your benevolence, Metta, and forgive us both for our transgression. We both pledge ourselves as your followers in order to serve you, Acharya, from this moment forth. If you have any need for which we may be of assistance, please call us at any time. We are both willing and ready to serve you. It would be our pleasure. And we will also ensure the safety of the monk and Samanera that are residing with you. May you bless us with your benevolence, Venerable Acharya. My chitta withdrew from meditation and I contemplated what happened and discerned that the two of them were serpent demigods, Naga, living in the waterfall there. They were highly deferential toward me and provided me with assistance and protection. A few days later, I was disturbed by the racket made by a chittering civet. Each night, it chittered by my hut, Guti, for many hours on end. It was absolutely not conducive to practice. Then I thought of telling the two Nagas to chase the civet far away. Once I thought of it, I told them. That night, the civet chittered. Around 10 p.m., it was still chittering. Once I entered into meditation, I could hear people in conversation. Venerable Acharya is disturbed by this civet's chittering. Let us chase it away from here. Chase it far away and not let it come back to make any noise around here again. The two came near the kuti with a hammer and bludgeon in hand and walked directly to the civet. The civet scurried away as fast as it could, and the two of them struck out with their hammers and bludgeons as they chased it two kilometers away. They yelled after the civet, From now on, don't come making any noise around here again. If you do, we will kill you right away. I sat there watching as they chased the civet far away, stopped, and allowed the civet to escape. From then on, there were no more chittering civets. Another time, some mice had chewed up some things in my kuti and chased each other until it became irritating. So I told the Nagas to chase the mice away, and they came as before and chased all the mice into the forest. Thereafter, there were no more civets or mice to disturb me anymore. My practice in mental cultivation had continuity because there weren't any noises to disturb me. Now that I've told you about ghosts, I'm going to tell you a bit about heavenly beings, Devada, so that you have information with which to compare and contrast them. Everyone has been talking about ghosts and heavenly beings for a long time now, causing wide-eyed, cowardly practitioners to always dread them. When they are going to practice mental cultivation anywhere, they are all terrified of ghosts, as if all ghosts are mean-spirited. In actuality, the norm in Buddhism isn't even to call them ghosts. They are described with admiration and praise and called heavenly beings, devada. The term ghost is one that villagers use. The label has been used for so long that it is deeply entrenched in our minds. The day we start understanding the language of our parents and relatives, the word ghost starts taking root in our minds. A ghost has such and such characteristics. Its body looks like this. Its eyes look like that. Or however they choose to describe it. They do it to incite fear in the child. It's a means of preventing the child from going out at night. And even after growing up, that fear of ghosts still lingers. The first thing cowards think of is ghosts. They think that the ghost is going to come to spook them like this or spook them like that, and so they become afraid. In reality, it is their own thoughts spooking them, and they don't even realize it. Wherever they go, all they think about is ghosts. This makes them constantly startle in fear. The issue is that when you talk to practitioners of mental cultivation about any Dhamma theme, they know everything. But the instant you hit on the topic of ghosts, their eyes bulge in fear and their ears are on alert. This is one who is going to clearly know and see the truth of the Dhamma? One who can't even conquer the first stage, ghosts, 
is going to lead oneself to the path and fruit of enlightenment? What we call ghosts and heavenly beings, devada, both reside within the same being. Each day, we are both ghosts and devadas in the same person. For instance, you have some displeasing preoccupation, aramana, so you immediately act out in a ghostly manner. This is the real ghost. Why aren't you afraid of this one? Whenever your mind is bright and happy, you want to make merit and observe the precepts, your mind is benevolent toward all beings, your mind is ashamed of all evil acts, or your mind fears evil kama. In those times, your mind has become a devata. Those who wish to see ghosts or devatas should look no further than within themselves. They will very clearly recognize a ghost and devata in there. This is called the ghost within and the devata within. We are ghosts with the body controlled by the four elements, jatu tatu, and the five aggregates, panchakanda. The ghost without and the devata without is the same way. The only difference is that the ghost without does not have the four elements. For example, a single life force, vijnana, can inhabit either state because its mind is full of greed, anger, and delusion. It can employ devious ruses in ceremonies or cause someone to die. In this case, you'd call it a ghost. But if the vijnana finds humanly actions, such as dedicating merit to it, or dedicating the fruits of mental cultivation to it, pleasing, then it will have love for you and will help you be happy and prosper. In this case, you'd call it a tevata. Thus, ghost, devata, and human all exist within the same life force, vijnana. The only difference is a ghost and devata only possess vijnana. They do not possess a physical body or four elements like humans do. They similarly possess personality, demeanor, and needs. Humans may be more skilled at fooling fellow humans than ghosts are at fooling humans. If a vijnana embodies virtue, it is called a high-level devata. They don't bother with humans because they have their own merit on which to rely. They have moral shame, hirit dhamma, within their minds, and moral dread, otapat dhamma, within their vijnana. As for vijnanas of lower virtue, they will interact with humans all the time. For example, when there are meritorious ceremonies, they will be invited to rejoice, anumotana, in the merit with the humans. There are some vijnana who feed on the sacrifices that they have tricked humans into making. But their deceit is on a different level from the manutsa peto, who purport to be human but have the heart of a hungry ghost, peta, and trick their fellow humans. This can be seen everywhere. Manusa peto are human ghosts, who are more deceitful and cunning than actual ghosts themselves. That's why humans are classified into many groups. For instance, manusa devo have a human body but a heavenly being, devata, mind. Manusa manuso have a human body and human mind. They strive to cultivate virtue. Manusa peto have a human body, but a hungry ghost, peta, mind. Manusa tirachano have a human body, but an animal, tirachana, mind. Another group is that of the human body, but demon, asura, mind. These manusa asurakaya are especially proficient at trickery. Whatever personal gains can be acquired through deceit, they'll seize it all. Their minds don't contain a crumb of virtue. They are demons controlling human bodies. Actual demons don't have a body. They deceive humans into feeding them sacrificial offerings. Wherever foolish humans have built a shrine of a household god to offer pig's head, chicken, food, or sweets, these demons will tend to show themselves. They will impersonate protective spirits or sacred beings and immediately take possession of that shrine. Foolish humans will bring them high-quality offerings on a regular basis. What's worse, they venerate and ask these demons for help. Before the start of the Vasa, I was constantly aware of myself. My practice was solid, my mind was unusually steadfast, and my mind was resolute. The strength of my mindfulness, Sati, and the strength of my wisdom, Banya, and the strength of my decisiveness were at exceptionally high levels. It was like I was teeming with resolute decisiveness, braveness, and fierce single-mindedness. These attributes were the results of my past practice. It was my first time knowing what I was capable of. I shouldn't describe what it was like in order for someone else to feel and understand it, because it's like when you have finished eating and are full. Describing the feeling of being full so that someone who is hungry will understand is impossible. Even if I explain it, someone who has never experienced the Dhamma will be unable to know and see what I'm talking about. 
Likewise, whatever dhamma that results from one's practice, pati pati, will be one's private treasure. The random speculations by analysts and scholars of theoretical knowledge, bariyati, will never get it right. Thus, though theoretical knowledge, bariyati, and applied practice, pati pati, share the same path, bariyati is merely the formula for bariyati. It will never result in the pati pati result. I have done significant studies of theoretical knowledge, bariyati, and applied those principles in actual practice, pati pati, until I received actual results. That is how I know that the results of applied practice greatly differ from theoretical knowledge. It is like one person has learned the names of food, but has never tasted the food, and therefore doesn't know what the flavors are like. Another person has learned about food and has tasted the food, and therefore knows the different flavors of different kinds of food. What this person who knows from actual experience feels is completely different from what the person who knows from manuals feels. Similarly, the results gained from learned knowledge and the results gained from applied practice are completely different. Thus, I dare to tell people that one day in the future, if you are interested in Dhamma practice, you will certainly know the flavor of Dhamma on your own. Once that time arrives, you will also dare to tell others about the flavor of Dhamma. It is like a person holding fruit in their hand, but they haven't eaten it yet. They're unable to know what the flavor of that fruit is like. But once they get a taste of that fruit for themselves, they will immediately know that the flavor is like such and such. Likewise, studying theoretical knowledge and passing judgment on those who are practicing, that they are doing mental cultivation incorrectly like this, or practicing incorrectly like that, or doing mental cultivation correctly like this, or practicing correctly like that, are merely conjectures of the foolish know-it-all. They have no clue what the actual results of practice are like. If you do not yet truly know and truly see the results of your own practice, then you should not brag that you know it all, nor should you guarantee the attainment of others as wrong or right. It'll fit the characterizations of the blind leading the wise, the pretentious fool, the blind losing their way, and the blind leading the blind. These are merely some points for you to mull over. Even as I explain the results of practice to you at this moment, I am not borrowing someone else's results of practice to write about. I do not have the intent to brag or claim that I practice well in order to gain your respect. I'm only writing about what actually happened, my actual results from my actual practice. What anyone thinks or says is their problem. May I, in this lifetime, leave this truth with the world for those who are born after I am gone to know, so that they may realize that during Buddhism's decline, there existed those who were fruitful in practice and deserving of the term arahanta asunya loko. As long as there are those who practice correctly according to the Dhamma and monastic code, Vinaya, then arahants will still exist in this world. From the very start of practicing mental cultivation at this place, there was something unusual about myself. For example, when using wisdom to contemplate various angles of Dhamma themes, there was such clarity and transparency. When contemplating on any universal truth, such a Dhamma, a comprehensive clarity would effortlessly arise and any doubts in my mind would instantly be extinguished. Using wisdom to contemplate in a way that engenders comprehensive clarity is where all such Adama wisdom congregates. This is because this comprehensive clarity is the device that directly destroys wrong view and attachment within the mind. If you contemplate a particular problem, once comprehensive clarity arises, attachment within the mind instantly dissolves. Previously, the mind was enchanted by the three realms because avicca, or that which is not true, covered things up for so long. Wisdom was never used to train and teach the mind in any way. Even the truth that exists within us and in external things was never known or seen. As a consequence, the mind became delusional and was always misunderstanding things. Once wisdom was used so the mind could know and see clearly, the truth emerged in the mind. It became known that defilements and sankhara had been selling falsehoods, causing the mind to be in a perpetual state of delusion until the mind grew accustomed to it. It has been deluded with this world for a long time. Now, the mind has wisdom as its trainer to teach it to know and see things according to reality at all times. The mind has comprehensive knowledge. The mind has discernment. The mind has the ability to know and see very clearly what is real and what is fake. Once the mind possesses this comprehensive knowledge and reason, it will firmly have self-confidence that after using wisdom to teach the mind often, the mind will gradually awaken from its wrong views. 
This is using wisdom to train the mind to know and see according to reality that every single thing in this world is subject to impermanence, anicca, suffering, tukka, and not self, anatta. There is nothing in this world other than these three common characteristics, talakana. In the past, I had used wisdom to contemplate universal truths, such a dhamma, in certain rudimentary objects. Comprehensive clarity had arisen, and attachments and doubts had been severed. It hadn't necessitated a second round of contemplation at all. This is what happens when the mind has clearly accepted true knowledge and true realization through wisdom. Doubts and misgivings were destroyed automatically. Feelings of love or hatred, and feelings of pleasure or displeasure in whatever object had been extinguished from the mind in that very instant. At that time, it was as if the three realms, the sensual realm, gamma pava, the fine material realm, rupa pava, and the immaterial realm, arupa pava, had converged in that one place. I knew and saw how the vata chaka, or the cycling through the three realms, worked. I knew and saw what the cause and factors of delusion were that compelled us to be born and die in these three realms for such a long time. I knew and saw the entirety of the path of cycling through rebirth, vatataka, and I knew and saw with great clarity the method to prevent my mind from cycling through the vatataka. I knew and saw very clearly that cycling through rounds of rebirth, sangsara, would only bring about constant suffering, tukka, harmful consequences, tosa, and future perils, baya. So I applied my wisdom in contemplating in a more refined manner issues stemming from the past into the present and extrapolated the future that would take shape in future rebirths. With sharp wisdom, I knew and saw all of this very clearly. Within the three realms, there was nothing that could hide from this wisdom. Everything would be known and seen and pierced and penetrated.